for leading us this morning. Also, thank you to all of you for being here today with us, especially those who are joining us by radio. Thank you for tuning in. This morning, I'm preaching a message titled, How to Enjoy the Holidays. Thanksgiving is a couple of weeks away, and directly behind it is Christmas. And if your family is like ours, this is the busy, hectic season about to begin. Is anybody else with me on that? This is about to start. And somewhere midpoint, we start wishing for January. Like, let's get this over with so we can go back to some normal, uh, normalcy in life. That's not how it's supposed to be. So this morning, I'm preaching a message on a very familiar passage, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Let's all stand together. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Holy Spirit, we pray this morning, as we embark on this busy season of life, Turn our minds and our hearts towards Jesus Christ. When the joy killers come, help us to rejoice, knowing that we know you as our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, let everyone say, Amen. You may be seated. The central theme of the book of Philippians is joy. In fact, Paul mentions joy or rejoice about 16 times. Joy is the Greek word kara, and rejoice is the verbal form kairo. Either way, 16 times he mentions joy. Be joyful. Rejoice. Let me give you some examples. Philippians chapter 1 verse 4, he says, In every prayer of mine, I'm making requests for you all with joy. Chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Chapter 3, verse 3, he says, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh in you. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown. And the verse we just read, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say, Rejoice. If you need joy in your life, Philippians is the book to read. But there's something more. Listen to verse 12 of chapter 1. Paul says, I want you, know, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And my question is, Paul, what's happened to you? Well, go to the very next verse. He says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Paul is in prison when he is writing these words. When he is telling the people to be joyful and that I am rejoicing, he's actually in a dungeon. We don't know for sure whether it was Rome or Ephesus or Caesarea. If Caesarea, we were actually there back in January, and we stood in the room, it's hard to read it, where Paul made that famous statement, I appeal to Caesar. And we took some pictures there. It was so beautiful to see the Mediterranean Sea directly behind. This was the room where the judgment was made, to Caesar you shall go. And as pretty as the scenery was, more than likely Paul did not enjoy watching the beautiful blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. He was in a prison. Yet the point is this. 
he was joyful. Listen very carefully. Joy is not hinged on our circumstances. Joy is not just happiness when things are great. Man, by golly, I tell you what, we're, we're having a great time. God is so good. No, when you are in a prison cell knowing that very soon you will be executed, he is saying, I'm so joyful and I want you to rejoice. Let me ask you some questions this morning. How is the joy level in your life today? Here's another question. Would people around you call you a person of joy? That's a tough one. This is why y'all came Sunday morning, didn't you? It's like, man, we should have slept in. Would people around you call you a person who brings joy and gladness in your heart, or do they say, it's exhausting to be around them? Do you bring pain, or do you bring joy in the lives of people near and dear to you? You see, the season of thanksgiving and the season of joy is upon us, but in many homes, it will be anything but joyful. Whose home are we going for? Is it going to be Christmas, your home? Or is it going to be New Year, our home? And I tell you, I hope they don't show up this time. I tell you what, I, last year, I, she, I know why she said what she said. I know what she was thinking. Running hectic, frustrated, stressed out, and then taking that stress out on people around you. You see, Thanksgiving and Christmas can be a time of great joy. Or like somebody told me just recently, it's like, oh, I dread it. I dread this time of the year. This morning, as we walk through this message, how to enjoy the holidays, here's another question. Are you saved? I ask that question every time because the Bible asks that question. Are you saved? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Because if you do not know Christ as your Savior, no wonder you don't have any joy in your life. See, when you have Christ, it's much more than happiness. It is joy, which is not hinged on circumstances, and it bubbles over and it affects the lives of people around you. Now, they are joyful. Five things we're going to learn from this passage on how to enjoy the holidays. Number one, find joy in everything. Listen to verse four again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, if you read this verse out of context, you will miss the reason why Paul stresses the word always, and then he says, rejoice again. You have to read two verses prior. It gives you the understanding. Why did he say that? Well, listen to verse 2. He says, I implore, or meaning I beg, Judea, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Eudia and Syntyche were two women in the church. Paul is telling them, I beg these two women to please get along. I'm a pastor. I'm like, they're causing trouble. Get them out. We'll be better. But listen to what Paul says in verse 3. He said, and I urge you also, true companion, whoever is the pastor, Paul says, I'm begging you to help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul says these two women are at odds with each other. I'm begging you to help them make it right. And then he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The point is this. These women loved the Lord. They were of a great help to Paul in his ministry. But for whatever reason, they were at odds with each other, and it was tearing apart the Philippian church. Joy was going out. And Paul says, Get them together. Please. They are good people. They help me a lot. Their names are written in the book of life. And rejoice again. 
Would you agree with me this morning that life has many joy stealers? And the joy stealers are not necessarily financial problems because, man, in time, you're going to come back on top. The finan- it's not just the health problems because, yes, health reasons, you can expect it and things go wrong and you have to deal with it and surgeries and all that. The biggest joy stealers of life are relationship conflicts. There's problem in the home. When husband and wife can't get along, when brother and sister can't stand each other, when two friends don't want to talk, joy begins to leave our lives. And by the way, it doesn't end there. There are so many other problems, crime and, and morality and bad news and the unexpected of life, they tend to deplete the joy from our Christian life. In fact, as I was typing these words, I work with a Mac, and all of a sudden, anybody, anybody else work with a Mac? The rainbow wheel of disaster began to turn, and my Word document just went bloop. Now, I have set up the Mac in such a way that every 10 minutes it'll save, but this was five minutes, and I was like, no, no, oh my goodness, I don't know what I've written. And the Holy Spirit just in his own way spoke in my heart. Well, okay, now it's time to put it in practice. You, you want to tell those people to get along and get it right. And you can't even rejoice when your computer goes down. Folks, I can remember a thing. The only thing I can think is maybe the Holy Spirit didn't want me to say what I was going to say. So he took it. I'm like, God, next time just tell me. I, I will delete it. There's got a button called delete and I will backspace it and take it out. Don't just shut down my computer. The bottom line is, joy is a choice. Sometimes it is big problems, relationship conflicts. Sometimes it is as simple and as infinitesimal as a computer shutting down. But joy is a choice. You can either choose to be hateful, painful, sorrowful, stressful, take it out on your wife or your children or your husband and your parents, or you can choose to be joyful. This happened, but God is still in control. Paul says, these women are not getting along. Help them. Please, they're precious to me. And rejoice again. Let me ask you this morning, what is your choice this holiday season? What is your choice? What joy killers are lurking in your life? Who is that person that you know will say something, do something, act in a way, and there goes your joy? Here's a deeper question. Is your heart full of the Holy Spirit? Did you know the fruit of the Spirit? We often just jump from love to self-control, but what's the second fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy. Show me a person who is void of joy, and I will show you a person who at that moment is not filled with the Holy Spirit. So number one, Find joy in everything. Joy is a choice, not hinged on circumstances. Choose joy. Let the Holy Spirit bring it to your heart. It's a choice. Number two, focus on being gentle. Listen to verse five. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. The Greek word for gentleness can also be translated kindness or tolerance. It has the idea of being willing to bend. Gentleness does not mean compromise. What it does mean is learn to get along. Not everybody's going to see things your way. They have issues, but you know better. Learn to be gentle. Don't be rude, don't be hateful, don't be impatient, but be kind, gentle, and patient. Prove it. Don't pick up the Bible and start beating people over the head. In your attitude, in your demeanor, let there be gentleness. And what is the motivation, those five words? The Lord is at hand. It could mean the Lord is coming soon, but it also has the meaning of the Lord is near you. He is watching how you handle this one. Again, let me emphasize, folks, 
Gentleness does not mean compromise. Sometimes you have to stand up for the truth. You have to do what needs to be done. You have to be direct. You have to be forthright. You have to confront people. Having said that, let your gentleness be known. Because God is watching. Do you believe that God is watching? Wow. I don't think we got folks here who think God is everywhere. God is watching. It's like that old story, an you know, old illustration. If you've been in church through your life, I guarantee you've heard this one. Children were lined up in the cafeteria for lunch. At the head of the table was a basket of apples. And there was a note under that basket, take only one. God is watching. Moving further down the table, there was a tray of cookies and some smart aleck put a note there saying, take all you want. God is busy, busy watching the apples. <laughs> God is watching the apples. God is also watching the cookies. Don't ever say, I'll tell you what, if God knew what they were doing, God knows what they're doing. God also knows how you're acting. God also sees when you are impatient, when you are bitter, when you are hateful, when you cut people down, God sees that too. Live every moment as if God is watching you because he is. People tell me, great message. This message is for me. I'm preaching to me. I'm preaching to me. God is watching my gentleness. Question again, are you a gentle person or are you a judgmental person? It's easy to pass judgment, isn't it? Beware of self-righteousness. Folks, that is <laughs> just when you think, I know better, you stop being gentle. Beware of that pride. Is your heart full of the Holy Spirit? Because let's go back to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Gentleness. Find joy in everything. Focus on being gentle. Here comes number three. Fight anxiety with prayer. Listen to verse six. Be anxious for nothing. Folks, I'm taking this from the Bible. It's, it's in your Bible too. Amen? It's in the Bible, and it's in the same context of two women who couldn't get along. The word for anxious in Greek is the word meri manao, which originally came from two Greek words, meridzo and nous. Meridzo means divided, nous is mind. Anxiety originally had the concept of a mind that is torn apart. Another synonym for anxiety is worry. You know, worry comes from that German word, worgen, which has the idea of strangling or choking somebody. When anxiety and worry is in your heart, somebody is choking the life out of you. Many of y'all have heard of Chuck Swindoll. Listen to what he said about worry. He said, stress and worry break us down. They are the unseen source of our headaches, backaches, heartaches, and belly aches. They produce everything from obesity to obscenity, from constipation to diarrhea. I know you didn't want to hear that this morning. From impatience to impotence, they give us knotted stomachs, Sleepless nights, high blood pressure, low morale. Here's a question for you before we continue the comment. Is your home, is your family, is your get-together going to have a low morale or a high morale? Well, I tell you what, if so-and-so shows up, it's going to be a low one. You have the light of Christ in you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Swindoll goes on and says, they make our tempers short and our days long. They cause indigestion, irritation, chest pain, muscle strain. And then he says, you do not get stomach ulcers from what you eat. Said one doctor, you get ulcers from what is eating you. May I add something to Swindoll? And you also give ulcers to other people. What's the solution? Well, listen to the next line. It's not enough to say, well, don't worry, be happy. I tell you what, you just need to be happy and not think about it. It doesn't work. 
Listen to what he says. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. The antidote to worry and anxiety is prayer. Pray with thanksgiving. Be grateful for what God has done for you. Thanksgiving season. Hey, listen, I'm all for shopping because that's wonderful. Go shop. Go get things you want and go give things that will make people happy. All that is wonderful. But also stop and say, I'm grateful for what I already have. What do you already have? Life. Salvation. Friends, family. This great nation. Paul says, pray. With thanksgiving, let God know what you need and what's going to happen. Listen to verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, means it doesn't make sense, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Pray with thanksgiving. Let God know what you want. Once again, an old illustration that I've given before, and I'm sure you've heard it from some pastor somewhere. Frederick Handley Page of England was one of the pioneers in the early days of aviation. He, he was in World War I, and he tells a story of how once he was flying, and he heard the sound that pilots in those days did not want to hear, the sound of a rat gnawing. I've heard that sound before in the attic, not at the house we live or where we used to live, and it's a very annoying sound. But when you're in a plane and there is no possibility of landing, no autopilot that you can put that on autopilot, go back and kill the rat or whatever, what do you do? The rat could be gnawing on a wire, it could be gnawing on the fuse line or, or a fuel line. Frederick knew that a rat is a rodent that is not meant for great heights. So he began to climb higher. As he began to climb higher, he could still hear the rat gnawing. He kept on climbing higher, and the gnawing became a little sluggish, a little slow. He kept on uh, climbing, and guess what happened? All of a sudden, it stopped. Anxiety is a rodent that cannot survive in the secret place of the Most High. When you and I are ridden with anxiety and fear and frustration, it is not going to work to say, but you don't understand what I'm going through. Have you prayed? It's enough enough to say, well, if you were in my shoe, you will understand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Give it to God. Here's a question this morning. How is your prayer life? You know, when seasons get busy, the first thing to go out the window is what? Prayer. <laughs> you know, I'm preaching to me. When I get busy, the first thing to go out is prayer because I, I think I'm already praying. I mean, shucks, I'm preparing a message. Now, isn't that prayer? No, it's not. Are you daily grateful for what God has already done for you? Are you making your request known to God? This person is going to be a problem. I know I'm going to have to face them. And it is always going to be a conflict. They're going to always make that remark. And it's going to be a problem. Have you prayed for that person? What do you pray for? God, would you zap them? No, pray, God, would you bless them? And don't just say bless them spiritually. You know, we always want to bless people spiritually. Just don't give them any money, Lord. Let them be broke. Bless them mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and financially. God, would you bless this person? You know what's going to happen in the process? You will start climbing higher in the secret place of the Most High. God will deal with them. That is not your business. But anxiety is God's business. Find joy in everything. Focus on being gentle. Fight anxiety with prayer. Here comes number four. Fix your mind on what's positive. Listen to verse eight. Finally, brethren, 
whatever things are true means you're going to hear a lot of gossip. I'll tell you what. This is what I heard her say. Now, you know, don't quote me on that, but this is what she said about you. Paul says, let's not get into that. Whatever is true. Whatever is factual. Whatever things are noble. Whatever things are just. Whatever things are pure. There are some things that are impure, evil. Some things that are pure and holy. Whatever things are lovely. Whatever things are of good report. If there is anything any virtue, there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. People have a misunderstanding of meditation. They think meditation is sitting up in the Himalaya mountains and, and gazing at your navel or something. And I mean, it's, we have a very distorted understanding. Meditation is when you think about the promises of the Word of God. Meditate on the true, the noble, the just, the pure. The good things that are happening. I tell you what, my kid has this, this, and this problem. I tell you what, your kid is also good in this, this, and this. You become what you focus on. My wife, I tell you what, she, she would just stop doing this and this and this. Focus on what's good about her. You don't have any idea what I have to live with. He is he's a jerk. He's like this and he says that. Focus on what is good about him. It's tough. The church family, uh, focus on what is positive. And then listen to verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying, if you need help finding positive things, copy me. You know, there are people in this church body and some are here at the 8.15, some will show up at 10.45, 6.30, some will not be here this weekend. But do you know that every one of you here this morning, there's something about you that I copy. You say, you don't need us. I mean, <laughs> you're a theologian, you, 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 you are a pastor, you have your heroes and your mentors. No, there is something about you. Maybe it's the way you treat your wife. Maybe it's the way you have faced circumstances in your life. Maybe it's the way you raise your children. There's something beautiful about you that I find worthy to copy. That's what Paul is saying. Things you have learned, received, heard, and saw in me, try those. Let me ask you this morning, what are you focusing on? You're focusing on that person, that problem. Yeah, it's a problem. No, you don't need to compromise. Yes, it has to be dealt with. But are you focused on it so much that anxiety has taken over your heart? Or are you focused on what is true and noble and just and pure and lovely and praiseworthy? Are you thinking about the good that God has done for you? You know, humility is directly related to gratefulness. When I'm grateful, I become humble. When I'm ungrateful, pride comes in. It's all me. Let me show you what all I've done. I tell you what, you have no idea what I've been through and look what I've done. When I'm grateful and think and remind myself that I could have done all these things and more and still I could have been in the gutter, that's gratefulness. Humility follows. Who are you copying? Who's your mentor? I see mentors all over this room, folks. You don't have to go find some superstar or super preacher. They are in this room. They may not be perfect in everything, but I tell you what, you're going to find something in them that's worthy to copy in your life. Here comes number five. Fill your heart with Christ. Listen to verse 10. Paul says, "Not, But I rejoiced in the Lord. In the Lord. She said, I'm, I'm happy in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished. Again, though surely you did care, but you lacked opportunity. But then he says, not that I speak in regard to need. Paul says, I'm happy, but it's not because I got stuff from you. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I'm satisfied. I know how to be abased. It means I know how to to have nothing, but I also know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, 
I have learned how both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he makes that famous statement, which is distorted so many times when people think it's about, you know, how we can slam dunk a ball or, you know, man, be the top on everything because Christ has strength. No. What Paul is saying is, whether I'm broke or I have plenty or I'm hungry or I'm satisfied, either way, I can do it all through Christ who strengthens me. Paul is full of Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether he has or he doesn't have, gets the job, doesn't get the job, gets the admiration, doesn't get the admiration. It doesn't matter. He said, I can do it all. Because Christ is in me. Several years ago, we went on a mission trip to Mexico in the Yucatan. And we were in, in, in the part of Mexico where it is, uh, they didn't even have electricity. I mean, this is in 2000, the late 2000s. Uh, they didn't have power, and, and people were poor, barely living in these makeshift huts. And we spent the day doing activities with the children. In the evening, we would have preaching, messages, movies, whatever, for the whole village. The whole week. And we spent a lot of money to go there and then work hard and eat food you've never eaten in your life. Your stomach gets messed up and all that stuff. And, you know, at the end of the week, we were packing up that morning to leave. And a few things were still going on with the kids. And a thought came into my mind. Is this worth it? <laughs> we came all the way here to do all this for what? To brighten up their week? That one week of their life? Is that all there is to it? As the thought was still in my mind, I felt a tap on my shoulder. And a man that I had seen throughout the week, he was there. He had a wife. He had two little children. He would always stand in the corner and listen. He came over, tapped me on the shoulder, and he tried to say something in Spanish, which people often do because they think I know Spanish. I wonder why. I wish I did. I really wish I did. And he asked me, so I called the translator over. I said, can you help me? He said, oh, he's asking for a Bible, La Biblia. Do you have a Bible for him in Spanish? I said, oh, yeah, we, got, we brought tons of Bible in Spanish, just didn't think people wanted them. He said, oh, that's all he wants. I pulled it out, gave it to him, and then the moment I began to do that, five other people, adults came over and said, hey, can we have one too? I said, sure, Give, began to give out the Bibles. The man didn't ask me for $100. He did not ask me, hey, look, you're, you're all going to be gone, you know, my children are hungry and, and we're poor and we're broke and I'm no, not sure if y'all are ever going to come back. Can you, can you give me something? Can, can you give me that stuff that you've been using all week? Can I, can I keep that? No, he wanted the Word of God. Not sure if they will have a meal tomorrow, but all he wanted was, can I have that? Here we have everything and we're still hungry for more. You see, unless Jesus is all that you need, you will never be satisfied. It's not wrong to go buy things you need and you've been holding off all year long. Man, Christmas time, i got to get this for my kid or i got to get this for my husband. It's nothing wrong with spending money and getting things you want. No, but here's the point. With or without those things, are you content? And the only way you will be is when Jesus is filling your heart. So the message is, is Christ all that you need? This holiday season can be a great time of the year, or it can be a miserable time, not only for you, but for people around you, unless you get your heart right. Would you all stand together? The Holy Spirit is speaking to your hearts. Unfortunately, lately, for some of you, it's all been about you. It's about you. It's about all about you. And maybe he brought you here this morning to remind you it's enough. And if he's speaking to your hearts, you need to do business with him. Never giving your heart to Jesus Christ. Today's the day to get saved. That's all. Pray. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning. Holy Spirit, guide us. Help us. 
to keep our eyes upon Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here who does not know Christ, draw them to you. It's in His name we pray. Oh, come out of sight.